Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to, uh, this is pediatric ophthalmology style grand rounds. We're going to do case presentations and uh, first uh, up is uh, Dr. Dries who's uh, uh, lately uh, become uh, uh, quite the expert on superior oblique dysfunction, surgery, and everything associated with it. He's going to share some of the wisdom that he's gathered. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and good morning, everyone. This morning, I'm trying to present something that will interest you with quite a bit of information and uh, fairly quickly. So what if I told you that the superior oblique muscle was not just one muscle, but rather two? And indeed, it kind of is. There are muscle compartments in multiple extraocular muscles. And this morning I'd like to talk about the compartments of the superior oblique and what that means clinically for diagnosis and surgical management. Thank you to Dr. Uh, Joseph Diemer at UCLA and Steve Archer at the University of Michigan for helping me with figures and uh, multiple discussions over the more recent years. Here you're looking at the histology of the superior oblique muscle belly with multiple cuts starting posteriorly and then the cuts march anteriorly. And the two colors correspond to two branches of the trochlear nerve. This green color innervates here, purple-ish color here, and here's a reconstruction of selective separate innervation of the two compartments of the superior oblique. Separate innervation, make sure that it has a totally separate one. Yes. So what does that mean clinically for diagnosis and surgical management? Well, we do need to talk just a bit about motor physiology of the superior oblique. As we all know, about the axes of rotation, the superior oblique is an intorter, an abductor, and a depressor. So here are a few diagrams. This is the vertical act axis about which the eye rotates horizontally that gets you oriented as to the position of the superior oblique tendon with regard to that axis, and you'll have to think about the other axes, sagittal and horizontal as well. This is in primary gaze, and it makes sense that this muscle has those three functions. What about in down gaze? Well, it does change a bit. It's a better intorter and abductor in down gaze, and that's in large part because, simply put, the muscle just pulls harder. But the superior oblique does have this unique anatomy, we all know, with an origin at the apex of the orbit, coursing anteriorly and curving around the trochlea and then tendon fibers fanning out in the globe. And in down gaze here, actually here, this is the eye in down gaze, you can't see the cornea very well. And it's kind of hard to understand why the muscle's a better intorter and abductor. So let's view the eye in down gaze 30 degrees forward. If you saw the movie The Matrix, they were fighting and they would freeze, and then the camera would pan over to a different perspective. That's what this view is like here. So the eye is in down gaze. Look what happens to the relationship between the belly of the superior oblique and the tendon. This is more or less perpendicular. Here it's more acute. And if you look at the vertical axis, you can see the position of the tendon has changed with regard to that axis, making a, a better abductor and down gaze. And the tendon is more at the equatorial position, giving it better in torsion and down gaze. The contribution from this unique anatomy is only about 5 to 15% increased in torsion and abduction. Mostly it's that the muscle is just pulling harder. So what does this mean clinically? Well, what's it like to have torsional diplopia? This is what it's like to have torsional diplopia. This is a 55-year-old photographer who supplied this Photoshop photo of what it's like to walk down stairs at an apartment complex. And um, I would just like to show you in this diagram the compartments of the muscle. There's a lateral compartment of the superior oblique and a medial compartment. The lateral compartment, its tendons insert on the posterior fibers of the tendon, and the medial compartments inserts on the more equatorial anterior fibers. So the lateral compartment has more depression, and the medial compartment has more intorsion. 
the case here is um, a lady mainly with tons of torsion. Okay, so you think maybe this is a selective medial compartment paresis. One could speculate. She has lots of torsion, eight degrees in primary gaze, but much more in down gaze, 15 degrees. Really makes sense that those anterior fibers are affected, right, in the medial compartment. And look at her uh, vertical deviation. It's really not that big. It's really quite small, and there's not much incompetence in down gaze. So the posterior fibers of the tendon probably are less affected. Probably the lateral compartment is less affected. So what surgery should, would, would help her because she's suffering? Prism isn't going to work. Well, let's go back to the 20th century and talk, talk about the Harada Ito procedure. Initially devised by Japanese Dr. Harada, Dr. Ito, just to anteriorize the front tendons of the superior oblique, but later Fells modified it by splitting the tendon and transposing these fibers temporally and anteriorly on the globe, giving them a better mechanical advantage to in torsion. How did it work? Well, quite well. Her extorsion is two in primary gaze, six in down gaze. She still has her hypertropia. Initially, she fused two weeks out, but three months later, she did have trouble controlling her diplopia again, especially in down gaze. Luckily, a small amount of vertical prism, and she was fusing, and she likes spectacles in the first place, and she's happy. So does she have a selective medial compartment superior oblique paresis? One can speculate, but we really don't have dynamic MRI that will really tell us this in these patients at this point. Let me just talk about one more case. I think this is bilateral, and maybe even a bilateral medial compartment trochlear paresis. A 60-year-old female director of medical directors at the University of Utah, torsional and vertical diplopia with a small head tilt going back to the teenage years, but it worsened recently after she had cataract surgery, which often happens with clarity of vision in patients with pre-existing strabismus. She had diplopia when driving and when reading. Let's look at her exam. Bit more complex than the last one, but look at how much torsion there is. 15 degrees in primary gaze, 16 degrees in down gaze. That is a lot of torsion. And let's look at her exam. Again, a hypertropia that's not large without much incompetence, which would argue that the posterior tendon fibers of the superior oblique and the lateral compartment probably are not as affected. She does have a V pattern and an esotropia in primary gaze. She doesn't have classic three-step parks bielschowski testing for superior oblique paresis, but I think she probably has a mass bilateral superior oblique paresis. When patients are this complex, you gotta break down the deviation. You gotta treat their extorsion, their esotropia with their V pattern, and their hypertropia. A superior oblique tuck might have, might have been a good choice, but I chose not to do that because she had such little incompetence of her hypertropia, and her hypertropia was small and down gaze. So instead, for her hypertropia, a contralateral inferior rectus recession is my procedure of choice, the yoke muscle of the paretic superior oblique. She also has the esotropia with the V pattern. She needed a medial rectus recession, one half tendon with infraplacement for the V pattern. But keep in mind, when you transpose recti muscles, you induce torsion. And if you infraplace the medial recti, you're going to make her extortion worse. So she had a bilateral Harada Ito. Bilateral with the goal of creating 15 to 20 degrees of mechanical encyclotorsion under general anesthesia, which we can do with a Mendez ring. The refractive surgeons know what that is, and the strabismus surgeons are beginning to learn about it. Because you can mark the lid, mark the limbus, do your surgery, change torsion, and measure how much you got mechanically. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to do this, but this seems to be the most convenient and easiest for me. So, how did she do? She was fusing in all gaze positions except for extreme down gaze. Her extorsion was five degrees in primary gaze, five in down gaze. Um, so, she did very well. And mainly, uh, the point here is, you know, could she have a bilateral medial compartment superior oblique paresis? So, what if I asked you, does the superior oblique muscle have two compartments? Well, you probably say yes. Thank you.